Uh, our last speaker today is Alexander Milivojevich, uh, who will talk about the rational homotopy types of closed almost complex manifolds. Uh, please. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for staying. Okay, so here's some general questions. Uh, what are the homotopy types of compact complex manifolds? So these are hard questions. Here's another one. Are there topological obstructions to admitting uh, holomorphic charts that aren't just obstructions to admitting an almost complex structure? Where an almost complex structure, it's like multiplication by I on the real tangent bundle. Uh, so it's a self map of the tangent bundle that squares the negative the identity. So in real dimension four, we have, we know something by, from Kadira's work on complex surfaces. So we can construct closed, uh, some compact without boundary, four manifolds that admit almost complex structures, but don't admit complex structures. But it, so here's a specific example, but there are plenty of examples. But in dimension six and higher, there's no known example of such a manifold that admits an almost complex structure, but does not admit a complex structure. Let's restrict to closed manifolds, so compact without boundary. Okay, but so if we ask for more or maybe less than holomorphic charts, we do have some information. So for compact Kähler manifolds, or more generally these co compact complex manifolds that satisfy something called the DD bar lemma, which is a metric independent statement, unlike Kähler, uh, the rational homotopy type, I'll say what that is, is determined by the rational cohomology algebra, by a result of Deline Griffiths Morgan Sullivan from the 70s. So, by rational homotopy type, so this isn't fully precise, but it's okay. Say that two spaces have the same rational homotopy type. If there's a map between them that induces an isomorphism on rational homology. Okay. So, you know, two spaces having isomorphic rational cohomology abstractly doesn't mean that they have the same rational homotopy type. You can just drop the word rational to get a more familiar statement. But this theorem uh, from the 70s is saying that if both of these spaces are compact Kähler manifolds, it does imply that they have the same rational homotopy type. So on the other hand, if we relax the condition of holomorphic charts and just look at Let's look at simply connected, almost complex manifolds of dimension six and higher. So from my thesis, this observation follows that in dimension six and higher with a caveat I'll explain in dimensions that are four mod eight, the other extreme in a sense holds that if you know that some algebra over the rationals is the cohomology, rational cohomology of a simply connected, closed, almost complex manifold, then every other rational homotopy type with that cohomology also contains a closed almost complex manifold in it. So here's a kind of a picture. So you take some rational algebra and you look at all the rational homotopy types that have that as its cohomology. And you ask, are there Kähler manifolds in here? So the answer is either no, not at all, or it's yes, in which case they're all contained in the same rational homotopy type. But if you go over to almost complex manifolds, modulo that caveat I mentioned, in high enough dimension, six and higher, simply connected, you ask, are there almost complex manifolds among these rational homotopy types? The answer is either no, not at all, or yes, there is, and there's at least one in every rational homotopy type corresponding to that cohomology. So it's all or nothing. All for Kähler, it was at most one. Here's another diagram. So here we have Kähler manifolds and these more general DD bar manifolds where the homotopy type, the rational homotopy type, which you can think of as the homotopy type modulo torsion, it's fully determined by the rational cohomology algebra. Then that's contained in complex manifolds, compact complex manifolds where we don't know what's happening. And that's contained in almost complex manifolds where the rational, so the cohomology algebra doesn't determine the rational homotopy type any more than it strictly has to. Okay, so you have freedom of varying the homotopy type while preserving the cohomology algebra and you get new almost complex manifolds. But to see this conclusion about almost complex manifolds, let's, um, so the goal is to describe the rational homotopy types of closed almost complex manifolds along with their rational churn classes and their fundamental class. 
So let's let's ask, what does a closed almost complex manifold look like rationally? What conditions does it satisfy purely in terms of rational information? So first of all, the rational cohomology has to satisfy Poincaré duality. The manifold has a dimension n, and it has a fundamental class such that this pairing in complementary degrees on cohomology, when you multiply classes and you pair with the fundamental class, that's a non-degenerate pairing. So almost complex manifolds also have these characteristic classes associated to them, Turing classes. These are integral classes, but we can also consider them rationally. So an almost complex manifold has a fundamental class, Turing classes. And when you have these Turing classes, you can multiply them up to the top degree, get a top degree class, and pair it with the fundamental class. And that gives you an integer. So these are the churn numbers, but they're not just any integers, they're integers that satisfy certain congruences coming from, you can think of it as coming from the T.S. Singer index theorem, generalizing Hertzberg riemann roch where you get, you have some rational polynomials in churn classes, this Todd polynomial, this universal rational polynomial in churn classes and the churn character of any complex vector bundle over your manifold. Uh, so th these are rational polynomials and Turing classes that have to integrate to give an integer by the Atiyah Singer index theorem. So these congruences describe a lattice in the rational vector space spanned by churn numbers. So in low degrees dimensions, uh, this lattice looks like this. Uh, so another point will be that on a closed almost complex manifold, the top churn class, top degree churn class, when you integrate it, you get the Euler characteristic. So for example, in real dimension two, a closed two manifold, it's top churn class is the first churn class. You integrate that, you get the Euler characteristic. You know it has to be an integer, but it also has to be an even integer. So that's the first example of this congruence, divisible by two. Dimension four, you have C1 squared plus C2 is divisible by 12. Dimension six, it's a bit more complicated and so on. Okay. So the top churn class has to give you the Euler characteristic. And so now if our dimension is divisible by four, uh, in middle degree, we have this symmetric bilinear pairing on cohomology induced by that point gray duality statement. So it's a symmetric bilinear non-degenerate pairing. And if you look at it over the rationals, well, you know that if you're on a manifold, that pairing will be the rationalization of a unimodular pairing over the integers. So you can express this intrinsically in the rationals as the intersection pairing in middle degree looks like it's diagonalizable over the rationals to diagonal matrix with plus and minus ones in the diagonal by a result of Milner, who's a molar. And so this pairing associated to the manifold, it has a signature. So the number of plus ones here minus the number of minus ones. And that signature is an integer. And by work of Tom and Hertzberg, you can calculate the signature by uh, evaluating some universal expression in some other characteristic classes called Pontryagin classes on the fundamental class. But if you have Turing classes, like you do on an almost complex manifold, these Pontryagin classes are determined by the Turing classes. So these Turing classes are compatible with the signature through this Tom Hertzberg signature formula. This some universal polynomial has to give you the signature of this pairing here. So for sufficiency, so these were necessary conditions on a closed almost complex manifold. What does a closed almost complex manifold satisfy? But now the other direction you can ask, given a rational homotopy type, uh, first of all, does it satisfy Poincaré duality on its rational cohomology? And then you ask, well, can I choose a fundamental class and can I choose rational churn classes so that all of those conditions from before are satisfied? Those congruences and that compatibility with the intersection pairing. So following Sullivan's approach to rational homotopy theory in the 70s and his solution of this problem for closed smooth manifolds, in analogy, we have this realization for almost complex manifolds, which basically says, if you have a simply connected rational homotopy type in dimensions six and higher, so even dimension six and higher. And suppose it satisfies rational Poincaré duality, uh, it's cohomology, and make a choice of fundamental class and churn classes. 
if all of those previous conditions are satisfied, congruence is the Euler characteristic being calculated from the top Turing class, the compatibility with the signature, then there really is a closed almost complex manifold with this rational homotopy type, these, this fundamental class and these rational Turing classes. Except there's a small caveat that in dimensions that are four mod eight, so starting in six, so it's starting in dimension 12, so 12, 20, 28, and so on. If you want the first Turing class to be zero, then you have to impose some further congruence conditions. Okay, so I initially thought this was a kind of a bug in my proof, but I think there's something interesting going on here. I don't know what. But basically, you have these additional congruences coming from the fact that if you have a manifold, closed almost complex manifold with first Turing class zero integrally, then it's spin. And in these dimensions, uh, four mod eight, that implies some additional congruences on the churn numbers. And the main characters in the proof are, so the Pontrag and Tom construction, you can think you take your rational homotopy type, that's this line here, and you get a vector bundle over it, complex vector bundle over with, let's say the churn classes you want, and you wanna produce a manifold, first of all, that maps to this rational homotopy type. And what you do is, so this is the Pontrag and Tom construction, you identify all the points that are far away so in this vector bundle, you identify all the points that are far away from the base space. You map a sphere into that construction. So this is called the Tom space. You map a sphere into that. You make it transverse to the, to the base space here in a suitable sense. Take the pre-image of this space. You get a manifold. Could be disconnected like this. And its normal bundle in the sphere is the pullback of this bundle here on the right. So if this had a, you know, this is a complex vector bundle. So is this normal bundle here. But then this manifold in the sphere could look nothing like this target space. So to solve that problem, you apply surgery to get rid of unwanted uh, homotopy or homology classes. So this is an example of a surgery on a torus where you take this vertical circle here, you thicken it a little bit, you just remove it, and you glue in two disks instead on the boundary, and you get a sphere. So you've killed the fundamental group of the torus fully. You remove this vertical circle along with its dual horizontal circle. So you do this and kind of get a manifold. Under the right conditions, you can do this and you get a manifold that looks like your target space, which is some rational homotopy type you want to obtain. Okay, so if this realization result lets us conclude that there is a closed almost complex manifold realizing a given rational homotopy type, then all the, con all the conditions were homological. So this means if you take any other rational homotopy type with the same rational cohomology, then that rational homotopy type can also be realized by a closed almost complex manifold. Okay, so that was that discussion of Kähler versus almost complex from earlier. And, okay. And then you could ask, well, what about specific rational homotopy types. Can I realize them by closed almost complex manifolds? So one that was kind of uh, interesting to work out was quaternionic projected three space, so 12 manifold, which classically is known that quaternionic projective space, HPN for all N positive, with its standard smooth structure does not admit an almost complex structure. But now with this theorem, we can see that there is some closed 12 manifold that has the same rational homotopy type as HP3, quaternionic projected three space, and also admits an almost complex structure. So concretely, how do you solve this problem? Well, you look at the cohomology of quaternionic projected three space. It's a truncated polynomial algebra, one generated in degree four, four, eight, 12, gets you to the top. And Basically, the problem of constructing a closed almost complex manifold with this rational homotopy type comes down to choosing a fundamental class and churn classes such that these uh, congruences are satisfied. So you get some complicated system of congruences among the churn numbers. And also now, the C1 is zero in this case. So that's why you get the more complicated congruences. Right. Well, they would have been complicated either way, but yeah, they're even more complicated. Oh, because you're in 12. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Already high dimensional, C computationally expensive already. 
Uh, yeah. And you have this condition here from the signature being zero because there's nothing in degree six on this manifold. And well, then you say, okay, well, the second, so there's no, the first, third and fifth churn classes, uh, they would have to be torsion just because the rational cohomology is not zero there, non-existent there. So the second churn class is some rational multiple of the generator, fourth churn class, some rational multiple of the generator degree eight. And the top churn class has to give you the Euler characteristic, that's four. And basically you get uh, the Apantian system of equations uh, in these coefficients. That if you can solve this, you get a closed almost complex manifold with the rational homotopy type of HP3. And the system does have a solution. In fact, unique among the integers. So, okay, you get a closed almost complex manifold with this rational homotopy type. So you can do concrete ca calculations like this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yes. Have you investigated the general Diffantine properties of the equation you write down? Wait, can you say it again? The beginning? Have you like a, think about the general Diffantine properties of the congruence equation you, you write down? I think it's, you can get any system you can dream yeah, of. Yeah, like the solvability of them. I mean, can you solve, it's equivalent to solving I think all Diffantian systems, pretty much. I think you can get you can get any Diffantian system. I think practically anything, any mess, you know, because it's you take this cohomology algebra and that can look like essentially anything, you know. It's restricted by point creative duality. It could be anything, and then you get these really complicated equations. Yeah. Okay. So making general statements, I, I wouldn't hope for it. Thanks. Does surgery, sorry, a question. Do you, does surgery allow you to only adjust certain, certain degrees? Well, like it works best up to the middle degree. Like let's say we're on an even dimensional manifold just for simplicity. Excuse me, Alex. Could I suggest that you draw a picture of a genus two map mapping to genus one and show the idea of the surgery? Because this is, a beautiful and simple beginning step of the surgery process. Uh, genus two? Yeah, mapping to a torus just by pinching off. Yeah. Every degree one map looks like that, so to speak. So this is like your X on the right, something yeah. that satisfies point gray duality. Right. right. And then there's a, the, you know, you can think that it, Pinches okay. off the left holes. Right. Yeah, let's see. So, who can we get rid of here? Let's say this one here. We want that to go. Right. No, but no, but show the map. I mean, show what the map, the map's degree one map. So, why don't oh, you pinch off oh. the left hand, you know, let the right hand hole go to the hole on the torus and the left hand hole gets pinched off. Right. Okay. So, I guess it's bigger. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. So what's being well, pinched off? Well, here we crush, you know, all of this to a point. Okay, fine. So, I mean, the point, I mean, I was just wanted you to explain that every degree one mapping looks like this in homology. Right. Even though you don't geometrically yet know it looks like that, but it looks like that in homology. And then now your previous picture, that he's asking, you put the previous picture with this picture, then that'll explain what he doesn't understand, right? So your previous picture, when you did the surgery, you killed. So he asked, which classes can you kill and stuff like that? All right, yeah, okay. All right, so yeah, which class can you kill? All right, so if you have a degree one map, yeah, so yeah, this is a good picture because on homology, a degree one map will be surjective. Okay, so there's this kernel on homology and essentially that's what you kill off. Okay, so here, whatever is in the homology of this part here that we're you know, crushing down to a point, you can annihilate. 
right? So, and how do you do that? Well, you take, let's do another color. So it was that picture. Well, let me just show that picture again from before. Uh, never mind. Take this circle here, thicken it, and cut it out, giving you something like this. Well, that's attached to here. And then you, you know, when you cut out this, so you cut out a cylinder, right? And you remove that and you can fill in the hole that's left with two discs, right? And now you've gotten rid of, well, you've gotten rid of this class you specified, this you know, vertical circle, but you also got rid of the other one. So it's two for one. But so we've gotten rid of this kernel on homology, everything here, right? So generally what you're getting rid of is this kernel on homology. Thank you. And ask in this picture, how does it compare but with almost complex structure? Right. So, so in the course of the proof, uh, let's say, uh, so you have this data that, let's say this is our picture. Like this. So this target manifold already has some bundle over it, some complex vector bundle. Okay, and from the Pontryagin Tom construction, we know that this manifold here, it's stable norm, it's normal bundle in some large Euclidean space that it sits in is the pullback by this map of this complex vector bundle. Okay, and so when you do the surgery, well, now it's kind of a a bit involved, but the argument is basically you can, well, you can transport this. Uh, hmm. How do I explain this? Mm -hmm. Basically, doing the surgery gives you kind of a manifold with boundary, such that at one end it's the manifold you started with, and at the other end, it's what you obtain after killing this kernel class, okay? And the construction is such that, so this is a manifold of boundary whose normal bundle in this Euclidean space, increase it by, increase the dimension by one is still pulled back from this bundle here. Okay, so kind of you look at the boundary here and it's normal bundle is still pulled back by this. It's still the pullback of this complex vector bundle here. So when doing the surgery, you kind of have to show that you still have this property that the normal bundle, this manifold of boundaries pulled back from this bundle here. I see. So you basically want to keep track of the normal bundle, make sure. Right. Yeah, it's really surgery with normal bundles. Yeah, killing classes, but you're also keeping track of the normal one the whole time. Yeah, these are called normal maps, right? Yes, normal maps. All right. So this map that induces this thing of normal bundles, normal map, and this whole setup, normal surgery. Okay, then thank you again. And can I make one more comment? Of course. Okay. I'd like to make one more comment because Alex and I have been talking about the caveat. He's been calling it the caveat. But in fact, and he didn't say in his exposition that if C1 were non zero, there's no caveat. It, it, it was written in the note, but he didn't say it. So when C1 is non zero, the theorem works in 8K plus 4 without any condition. But when C1 is zero, his proof shows that he can choose the, C, choose the manifold so that C1 is actually zero integrally. And if these congruence are satisfied, but then there's some fundamental, anyway, there's some further discussion that has to be done 
and it's opening up an interesting question about these Kalabi Yao manifolds, because those are manifolds with, with, in the Kähler case, C1 is equal to zero, and then you have, that's called Kalabi Yao, and you have this great theory of metrics and so on, and application to algebraic geometry. Uh, but a, this is like a pre Kalabi Yao manifold, because it's not yet even a holomorphic manifold. So uh, that caveat is sort of, I think it's there because of the Kalabi Yao manifolds are kind of special. There's something extra going on in this theory. So this was a surprise. So the caveat's actually a good thing. <laughs> Before I was like, the proof doesn't quite work exactly the way you want to. And now it's like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Do you, do you agree, Alex? I do agree, yes. Okay. <laughs> So Dennis, can I ask a question? You don't have to. You've already passed your PhD thesis. <laughs> oh. so Dennis, can I ask a question? What? Suppose C1 is positive. You still have this, you know, uh, oh, sorry, C1 is negative. You still have this theory of metrics. How is C1 equal to zero special? No, but the, the, the structure of his theorem, is what he's, what he discovered is that, see, I expected when I gave him the problem that he would just prove the analog that the net, the uh, necessary conditions are sufficient. I just expected that to be the probable thing. And, and it turned out he found this, the fundamental group appears with an extra thing when the C1 is zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the, the plot thickens, you know, it's more interesting. And just by coincidence, C10, I mean, if you have a compact complex manifold, if you assume the holomorphic line bundle is canonical bundle is trivial, then that's the correct analog of Calabi Yau. So you have Serre duality and all that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then if it's Kähler, then of course, but it's Kähler, it's just the C1 equals zero topologically is enough to get the holomorphic bundle to be trivial. For compact complex manifolds, you really need the line bundle to be holomorphically trivial. It doesn't follow from C1 equals zero. So this is like a pre-discussion. In the holomorphic case, it, it, there's more going on. And the notion of positivity and negativity, I don't think that makes sense in this context. I, I mm -hmm. haven't even thought about it. But I, mean, oh, yeah. not, I, 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 I actually never can remember what that means anyway in algebraic geometry. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. I don't know. It's something about ample line bundles and having lots of sections. But always... you can also choose. You can also pick some uh, line bundles so that uh, pick some Kähler one one form so that associate uh, Ricci form is positive anywhere. Like it, it's still about some positive condition. Yeah, I see. Okay. All right. So this is like pre. It's like you know, getting just getting the manifolds that satisfy the tangent bundle condition, and then. It's, it's been an open problem forever that uh, I think Gromov is the first one to point it out. When you have a compact complex manifold, you don't know anything more about the topology than the tangent bundle has a complex structure. I mean, one doesn't know in dimension, complex dimension three and higher. In dimension two, you have Podiris theory and all that. So you have more stuff going on for surfaces. But for higher dimensions, it could be that there are complex manifolds realizing every conceivable topological type that Alex's the thesis is showing uh, that works for almost complex manifolds. Or maybe it's very restricted, like Kähler manifolds, it's extremely restricted. You know, it's, it's like it goes from zero to infinity, one to infinity. Is, is infinity in the number? I don't know. <laughs> or it should be some number like 66. <laughs> You know, it's totally unknown. I mean, that's what this is about. I mean, it's like, we're desperate. We're dying of thirst. 